plans full of sliding surface bearings. You may not be clear on exactly what they are or how they work right now, but you've seen them. Boiler feed pumps, sump pumps, generators have them. So do fans and turbines. You already know what a bearing does. It keeps a moving part like a shaft in place, carries a load, and reduces friction. The next thing you need to know is what makes a sliding surface bearing different from any other type. Well, the major difference is this. In a sliding surface bearing, one surface slides over another. It figures then that the best way to approach learning about these bearings is to think in terms of how they handle friction, because that'll help you to understand how they're different and why. As we cover sliding surface bearings, we'll talk about the different ways they're designed, how they operate, what they're made of, how they're lubricated, how they fail, and the various types you're likely to come across. Then we'll go one step further. We're going to talk about how you can develop that edge that makes one mechanic better than another. It's like a sixth sense. It comes from observing what's going on around you, remembering it, and using it. You see, good mechanics store away detailed information on how a piece of equipment works. Or to put it another way, it's why one mechanic can be working at replacing a valve and senses by a shift in the sound of a pump a few feet away that something's wrong with it, but another one doesn't. A good mechanic uses information without even realizing it, perhaps, and uh, it gives him an edge. Okay, let's start by looking at how a sliding surface bearing works in general, the two basic types they come in, the kind of friction they're designed to handle, and the part that lubrication plays in their operation. We'll begin with this information for two reasons. They're pretty basic facts, and they're important. You'll need them to understand what comes later. Sliding surface bearings come in two types, journal bearings and thrust bearings. On both types, the bearing is the part that touches the shaft. Now, with a journal bearing, the journal is simply a place on the shaft that the bearing surrounds and supports. With a thrust bearing, the shaft has a thrust collar. That's part of the shaft or permanently attached to it. So when we use the term bearing in this case, we mean the part that touches the collar portion of the shaft. There's another term you'll hear as we talk about the two types of sliding surface bearings, and that's the word assembly. An assembly just means a collection of parts. For example, if we say, let's look at the bearing assembly, it might mean the bearing and the housing. But the most important thing to keep in mind is this. Only the part that touches the shaft is called the bearing in our discussions. Now, let's get back to journal bearings. This part is the bearing. Sometimes it's called a sleeve. It's the part that surrounds and supports the journal. As we said, the term journal refers to a place on the shaft like this. These bearings support radial load. That is, they resist radial motion like this. They can't support axial loads, or to put it another way, they couldn't keep the shaft from moving through the bearing. To support axial load, you need the other type of sliding surface bearing, a thrust bearing. A thrust bearing is used with a thrust collar. By the way, another term for a thrust collar is a thrust runner. Usually you'll find two bearings, one placed on each side of the collar. They're held in place by a housing. As we said, this type can only support axial load. It keeps the shaft from sliding through the bearing. Okay, we've covered two things so far. The fact that in this type of bearing, one surface slides over another, and how these bearings are placed in relation to the shaft. Sliding friction is the next point we're going to talk about. Sliding friction is the resistance to motion that occurs whenever one surface slides over another. You can't eliminate friction entirely but you can cut it down to a minimum. Sliding friction is reduced by lubrication. The way it happens in a sliding surface bearing is called film lubrication because a film of oil is created between the shaft and the bearing as the shaft rotates. You can see how the film is formed here. The lubricant that's in the housing is picked up by the shaft as it turns and pulled between the surfaces of the bearing and the shaft. When the bearing's in operation, the shaft actually floats on a film of lubricant. This film is not the same thickness all the way around the shaft. 
If you could see the process in action, you'd notice that the lubricant forms what looks like a wedge at the bottom of the bearing as the shaft spins. We've already said film lubrication is essential to the operation of a sliding surface bearing because it reduces friction. That's to say, if the film that separates the shaft and the bearing wasn't there, they'd rub against each other and eventually be destroyed. Another point to remember about film lubrication is that it makes it possible for a bearing to support a heavier load with less wear by distributing the load more evenly over the bearing. There's more to say about lubrication and we'll get to it later on when we look at specific types of bearings in detail and when we talk about lubrication systems. But this is a good time to stop and review what we've said so far. If you have any questions about sliding surface bearings, sliding friction, or film lubrication, now is the time to ask your instructor about them. Bearing material, what bearings are made of, is what we're going to talk about now. There's no simple answer to the question, what's the best material to use in a bearing? Different materials are used in different applications. We'll start by describing the characteristics or properties that bearing material should have. Then we'll discuss the various materials that are used to make bearings and the reasons why one material or combination of materials is better than another for a particular situation. The things that a bearing must do determine the properties it should have. They include strength, embeddability, conformability, bondability, seizure resistance, and corrosion resistance. By strength, we mean the ability to support load and the degree of toughness or resistance to wear that it has. Embeddability means how easily dirt or other particles can be pushed into the bearing. Now, it doesn't sound like a great characteristic at first, but if you think about it this way, it figures. If the grit can be pushed into the bearing material, it won't be cutting into the shaft. Conformability is another desirable property. It means how well the material can adjust to a slight misalignment or distortion of the shaft under load. Conform to the shaft, in other words. Bondability is the next characteristic a bearing should have. It means how well the bearing material will stick to another material. Yes, stick is what I said. Even though it's obvious that a good bearing material shouldn't stick to the shaft, but when you consider that many times a bearing's fuse to another part which acts as a backing for it, it makes sense. The part that it's bonded to might be the bearing housing, for example. This is a housing that has a bearing bonded to it. More often, it might be bonded to a bearing shell like this one. A shell is always separate from the housing. Now, the last two characteristics, seizure resistance and corrosion resistance, refer to properties that prevent undesirable conditions. Seizure and corrosion both fall into this category. By seizure resistance, we mean how well the bearing material can resist sticking to the shaft. If the bearing did fuse to the shaft, for example, the shaft couldn't turn. Corrosion resistance refers to the material's ability to withstand chemical attack. Let's say there are contaminants or impurities in the lubricant. These could act as corrosive elements that the material would have to resist. Earlier, we said there's no perfect bearing material because different situations require different characteristics. It's actually a little more complicated than that. Even if you had all six of these properties in a bearing, you couldn't have them all in an equal measure because some of the properties we've described are almost the opposite of others. For example, how could you have a material that was equally tough and embeddable? It's not likely. Or if you found a material with high corrosion resistance, it might have relatively little strength. That's the main reason why no one has come up with the perfect bearing material yet. In fact, bearings are often made of more than one kind of material. Suppose you're going to make a bearing and the first priority is that it's embeddable, but it's also got to be rigid. Then you choose to make it with the most embeddable material you could find that was also bondable. Why? Because it would be necessary to bond the embeddable material to a second material that was rigid enough to do the job. Well, we've covered the various properties a bearing needs. 
Now let's talk about how these properties show up in the different types of materials that are actually used to make bearings. There are several metals and non-metals that are used to make up a bearing. They include babbit, bronze, brass, rubber, plastic, and wood. Let's start with babbit. Babbit's probably used more often to make bearings than any other material. It's an alloy or mixture of the elements tin, antimony, and copper. The proportion of each element put into the alloy to make babbit depends on how the bearing's going to be used. But regardless of what proportions are used, babbit has enough of all the desirable properties we talked about earlier, except one, strength. Babbit's a relatively soft metal. It just isn't very strong, so it's always bonded to a backing that's made of a stronger metal, like steel or cast iron. Bonded to steel, let's say, babbit can be used to make a bearing that supports large loads and still has all the other properties we talked about to a satisfactory degree. There are two other alloys that are commonly used to make bearings, bronze and brass. Bronze is a combination of copper and tin. Brass is a combination of copper and zinc. Either of these alloys has a greater degree of strength than babbit. However, they don't have all of the other properties to the same degree. They're low in conformability, embeddability, and seizure resistance. But when strength is the most important characteristic a bearing needs to do the job, then either bronze or brass could be used. The non-metallic materials used most often to make a bearing are rubber and plastic. Wood is also used occasionally, but far less frequently than it used to be. Rubber is often used in a situation where it's possible for grit to get into a bearing. It works particularly well when the bearing's lubricated with water. Now, here's one that's lubricated with water. This particular one is known as a cutlass bearing. These grooves here allow the water to flow through the bearing. Any particles of grit that get in the bearing are pressed into its soft surface as the shaft rotates. Eventually, the grit is carried into the lube grooves and out of the bearing along with the water flow. The rubber bearing is bonded to a bronze sleeve. Without the sleeve, the bearing wouldn't be strong enough to do the job. Plastics also used to make bearings. Sometimes it's bonded to metal the same way rubber is. Plastic bearings are used in several kinds of applications, both in and outside of the plant. One situation where you're likely to find them is in a high-speed, low-load application like a kitchen blender. Plastic bearings are often used in food processing equipment because metal ones might contaminate food. Plastic is also used to make bearings for instruments that operate at high speeds. Wood's the last material on our list, but it's probably the first material ever used to make a bearing. Wood has one special characteristic that's different from any of the others we've talked about. If you soak it in oil, it's self-lubricating. Even though this is true, wood isn't used to make many bearings nowadays, but it's still a good bet in some situations. Okay, let's review what we've said so far. First, we talked about the different properties a bearing should have. They were strength, embeddability, conformability, bondability, seizure resistance, and corrosion resistance. Then we covered the various types of materials used to make them. They were babbit, the material most often used, bronze, brass, rubber, plastic, and wood. We also mentioned that sometimes one material is bonded to other materials to give the bearing additional support. And that just about covers the subject of bearing materials. If you have any questions about these materials or their properties, be sure to discuss them with your instructor before we go on. We've already mentioned that sliding surface bearings can be divided into two categories, journal bearings and thrust bearings. We're going to look at three types of journal bearings in detail now. A solid journal bearing, a journal bearing with a split housing, and a ring oil journal bearing. This is about the simplest sliding surface bearing you'll ever see. It's a solid journal bearing. The bearing's made of bronze. It's actually a separate piece, but it's pressed so tightly into the housing, it's difficult to get it out. 
This bearing has a groove cut into it to help distribute lubricant across the bearing. The lubricant, let's say it's grease, is put in through this hole at the top. The groove provides an easy path for the grease to follow. We should talk about installation of bearings with lubricant grooves for a minute here. Uh, you've got to be sure to install this bearing so that the location of the groove won't interfere with the formation of the wedge of lubricant. In other words, you've got to install it a certain way. Remember we said that the wedge of lubricant increases the load carrying capacity of the bearing? Well, when you install this type, you've got to place it so that the grooves opposite the section of the bearing that receives the greatest portion of the load. That's why this bearing's installed with the groove at the top. Now, this piece is similar to the one we just talked about. We took it out of another housing. You'll often hear a bearing like this called a bushing. This one's made of bronze, and it's also grooved. The major disadvantage of a solid journal bearing is that it's awkward to replace. In order to put in a new bearing, you've got to go through the trouble of removing the old bearing and the housing from the shaft. Then you still need to press the bearing out of the housing. Some bearings are designed with split housings, like this one here, so that you can avoid some of that. As you can see, it's easy to take apart. Only the top half needs to be removed in order to reach the bearing. In this one, the bearing's bonded directly to the housing. The bearing's made of babbitt. You can see that it looks different from the housing, which is made of steel. A grease fitting goes into this hole here, so grease can be pumped into the bearing. Well, the two bearings we just looked at were simple and relatively uncomplicated. The ones we used to point out the various features were small, but they come in all sizes and they can carry heavy loads. The next type we're going to look at is a ring oil journal bearing. Again, we've got a split housing. We've removed the bolts that hold the top half of the housing on so you can look inside. By the name, you know there's an oil ring in this particular bearing. This hole here in the upper half of the housing lines up with another hole in the upper part of the bearing assembly. The hole's here for two reasons, so you can replenish the oil supply when it gets low, and so you can see whether or not the oil ring is turning without having to disassemble the housing. It's a nice feature to have because sometimes oil rings stick. When they do, the bearing doesn't get the lubrication it needs and you've got a problem. The hole makes it possible to check out the situation every once in a while without having to take the bearing apart. Now you can see the bearing. It's in two pieces, just like the housing. Here's the shaft and the oil ring we mentioned earlier. You can see that the oil ring turns as I turn the shaft. Now the ring carries oil from the bottom of the housing up to the shaft. We'll demonstrate how this works a little later. Let's look at the upper half of the bearing again. Its shape makes sense when you realize that this slots here to give the oil ring space to move around the shaft. Now, if you looked closely at the ring earlier, you might have noticed that it's jointed here and here. The joints make it possible to open up the ring and slip it out. Now here's the lower half of the bearing. It's designed as a separate piece and it can be lifted out of the housing easily. Now if you look closely, you can see that it's two metals fused together. Babbitt bonded to steel. This particular bearing is designed to be water cooled. Operating heat is carried away by cooling water that flows through the steel shell that the bearing is bonded to. The cooling water flows into the shell at this point and exits here. Now, I'm going to loosen this connection so we can look at how the bearing is fit into the housing.
Another special feature of this bearing is that you don't have to remove the shaft to get the lower half out. It can be rolled around like this until it's on top of the shaft and then lift it off. To put it back, you just get it in the right position and here we are. Roll it under again. This feature is found in many journal bearings because it saves so much time when they need repairs. The bottom half of the housing acts like a reservoir for the oil. This hole here is used as a guide to how much oil needs to be added. As soon as the oil reaches this point, the reservoir is filled. Many housings have drain plugs that are used to drain out old oil when it's time to add a clean supply. Now, let's look at the seat. These ridges here are what the lower half of the bearing sits on. You can see that the back of the lower half is shaped to match them. This arrangement's called a spherical seat. The shape of the ridges and the way the bearing fits on them makes it possible for the bearing to adjust to some misalignment between the shaft and the bearing housing. As you can see here, it's free to align itself if the shaft isn't quite lined up. Well, to sum it up, we've seen three types of journal bearings. A solid journal bearing, a journal bearing with a split housing, and a ring oil journal bearing. We talked briefly about how ring oil lubrication works and the advantage of a spherical seat. We're going to look at the parts and features of thrust bearings next, but before we do, let's stop and review what we've just covered. Sliding surface thrust bearings are what we'll look at next. These are typical examples of the ones you'll find in the plant. As you can see, this type includes simple designs and complicated ones. Let's begin with the simplest type of thrust bearing. These bearings go next to a thrust collar. Two bearings are used to handle thrust load in two directions. The bearings are identical. They both look like this one. It doesn't have any movable parts. It's divided into segments by these grooves here. It's called a flat land bearing. The lands for which it is named are these areas between the grooves. This bearing's made of babbit bonded to steel. Lubricant is pumped into these grooves here. One edge of each land is slightly curved so that lubricant can get in more easily. Now as the collar turns, lubricant sticks to it and is drawn over the collar and the lands. Flat land bearings come in all sizes. This bearing is big because it carries a heavy load. It's possible to have thrust bearings much smaller by using a different design. Let's take a look at some others that are designed differently. The ones we'll look at are called tilting pad or Kingsbury thrust bearings. These bearings are set up the same way as the flat land bearings. This assembly includes two bearings, one on either side of the thrust collar. But the bearings themselves are very different. One difference is that instead of being a single piece with grooved segments, each bearing is made up of a number of separate parts called thrust shoes. These are made of babbit bonded to brass. The shoes rest on a support bracket and fit over these pins. They're free to pivot on the pins like this because the back of the shoes aren't flat. This pin on the other side fits into the bearing housing. It's what keeps the bearing bracket and the shoes from turning with the shaft. Now see how this bracket is curved slightly? 
That curve allows the bearing to adjust to a certain amount of misalignment between the housing and the shaft. In other words, it's a spherical seat. Let's take a look at the thrust collar. Remember we said the thrust collar is either part of the shaft or firmly attached to it. Well, this thrust collar has been removed from its shaft. There'd be a keyway exactly like this one, this notch here, on the shaft. A key, which is a hardened piece of metal, fits into both of the notches. The key forces the collar to turn with the shaft. Now, let's look at how this bearing is lubricated. You know that all sliding surface bearings create a film of lubricant between the shaft, or more specifically the collar, and the bearing. In this assembly, you've got a thrust collar with a thrust bearing on either side. As the thrust collar begins to rotate, the bearings are still. The lubricant that's in the bearings sticks to the collar as it turns and gets dragged between the collar and the shoes, creating a film of oil just like the one we talked about in the journal bearing. But there's a difference. Something more happens. As the speed of the shaft increases, more oil is drawn between the shoes and the collar. The oil forms a wedge and the shoes tilt. This wedge actually increases the load carrying capacity of the bearing. Without the wedge, the thrust load on the bearing would squeeze the film of oil out from between the collar and the shoes. Without the film of oil, the operating temperature of the bearing would increase and it would wear out more rapidly. Now, let's look at a different type of tilting pad thrust bearing. It's different in two ways. First of all, in this one, the bearing assembly is split into halves to make it easier to take apart and reassemble it. The other way it's different is that it has a set of leveling plates that rest inside the support bracket. The leveling plates equalize or level the load between all of the thrust shoes. The thrust shoes in this assembly are made of two metals fused together. The bearing is made of babbitt, the rest of the shoe is made of steel. Thrust shoes are built with a pivot on their back, right here, so they're free to move. The pivot rests on this plate. It's called a leveling plate. If you look closely, you'll see that as I push down on the plate, the two shoes on either side rise up. Why is it done this way? Well, if some of the thrust shoes were thinner than others, we'd still want them to carry their share of the load. If not for the leveling plates, the thicker shoe would receive more load from the shaft than the rest. Instead, the leveling plates actually lift the other thinner shoes up enough to ensure that they're all in the same relative position to the thrust collar. That's how the load is equalized between the shoes. The last thing you should look at is this key. It fits into a slot in the bearing housing and it keeps the bearing from rotating. Well, that covers the parts and features of three typical examples of sliding surface thrust bearings. The flat land thrust, the spherical seat thrust, and the thrust with leveling plates. Take a few minutes now to read through the material in your text and discuss what you've seen with your instructor. You don't worry about lubrication when a bearing sitting on a shelf in a warehouse. Before you take a bearing from the stock room, it's not your problem, but afterwards it is. When it's in operation, it must be lubricated. Without lubrication in the bearing, it'll operate in direct contact with the shaft. If that happens, you've got serious problems. Both oil and grease are used as lubricants in sliding surface bearings. Lubricating with grease is a fairly simple procedure. When oil is used, the systems involved are a little bit more complicated. We're going to look at a couple of lubrication systems, how they get lubricant into the bearing, and the shaft seals that keep the lubricant in the bearing. Let's start with oil lubrication systems. 
Earlier, we looked at a ring oil journal bearing. Now, let's see how it works. The purpose of the ring oil system is to get a steady supply of oil into the bearing. You can see how the oil ring sits on top of the shaft. The bottom of the ring passes through the oil reservoir and the housing. When the shaft turns, the ring does too. Some of the oil sticks to the ring and gets carried up to the top of the shaft. Then the rotating shaft carries the oil down into the bearing, forming a film of oil between them. Here's the actual bearing. Now, there's some oil in the reservoir down here. And you can see, as I turn the shaft, that the oil ring turns with it. The ring brings oil to the shaft. And you can see it starting to collect there. And some of this oil transfers to the shaft and spreads over it. That's how it gets carried down to the lower bearing half. Now that you know how the oil lubricates the bearing, let's talk about how you make sure there's enough oil available to keep it lubricated at all times. The housing for an oil lubricated bearing usually contains a quantity of oil. Most of the time, you'll find an oil level indicator placed outside the housing that's used to monitor just how much oil is there. When the level of oil gets too low, more is added. The way it's added depends on how the housing is put together. Let's look at some of the more common ways it's done. Many housings just have an opening on top. After the oil level drops past a certain point, enough oil is poured into the opening to get the level back to normal, where it's supposed to be. This type of housing almost always has a sight glass mounted on its side to monitor the level of the oil. Sometimes you'll come across a housing with what's called a flip cup on its side. A flip cup is just a small cup. It has a cap with a spring-loaded hinge. The spring keeps the cap closed so dirt can't get into the cup. The normal oil level in one of these is about half full. If the oil level drops below the halfway point, you just flip the top up and pour more in. Another way of maintaining the proper oil level is with a constant level oiler. This is a device that maintains a constant level inside the housing by feeding oil into it from a transparent reservoir. There's often a sight glass on the housing to indicate the oil level inside. The reservoir is transparent so that its oil level can be seen. The reservoir is refilled when necessary. Sometimes the oil for the bearing must be continually filtered or cooled, or, or maybe a, a pressurized feed is required. If that's the case, then a force feed system is used. A typical force feed system has a pump that pushes oil into the bearing. This feed water pump has a force feed system. It has a bearing housing that contains an oil reservoir, and the oil pump is here. This system also has an oil cooler located underneath the oil pump. In this example, oil from the reservoir and the housing goes into the oil pump. The pump is driven by a gear that is turned by the main shaft in the housing. The pump pushes the oil out through this pipe and into the oil cooler. Oil both lubricates and cools the bearing because it carries away some of the operating heat. Putting the oil through a cooler removes the heat that it carries away from the bearing. We mentioned that force feed systems might have a filter as well as a cooler. Filters remove dirt and other solid impurities from the oil. Solid particles in the oil could damage both the bearing and the shaft. If a system didn't have a filter, it would be necessary to drain the oil and replace it more often than you have to if the oil was filtered. If our system had a filter, it could go right after the cooler in the oil flow path. After being filtered, the oil would go into the bearing. Here it provides lubrication and absorbs some of the operating heat. It then flows into the reservoir and the housing. The reservoir always contains a certain amount of oil. The sight glass here is used to check how much oil there is in the system. After the oil is collected in the reservoir, it is directed back to the oil pump. Here, the cycle starts all over again.
Well, that about does it for oil lubrication systems. When grease is used to lubricate a bearing, the process is much simpler. It's usually just pumped into a bearing through a fitting in the housing. It's done with a grease gun, like this. Your plant will probably have procedures that say how much grease should be used. The procedures will also say how often greasing should be done. Okay, we know how to get the lubricant into the bearing. Now let's talk about how to keep it there and how to prevent dirt and other contaminants from getting into a bearing. The answer to both of these problems is shaft seals. You'll usually find a shaft seal between the shaft and the housing. The space you see here would be filled by a shaft seal. The two types of seals you'll probably come across most often are contact seals and labyrinth seals. A contact seal is usually made up of something soft like rubber or felt. They're usually fixed to the housing and rub against the shaft as it turns. That's why the material they're made of has to be soft. Otherwise, the rubbing would damage the shaft. Now, labyrinth seals are different. They're usually made of metal. The way they're set up, any leakage has to follow a long bending path to get out of the bearing. This is a labyrinth seal. It's made of two parts. This part rotates, the other's fixed. You can't see how the parts fit together from here, but on the other side of the housing, we've removed the part that rotates so you can see it. See the ridges here? They form one half of the seal and the ring that rests on the shaft forms the other half. The ridges on both parts fit into each other when the seal is assembled. Well, that about does it for both oil and grease lubrication systems and shaft seals. We've discussed in detail how a ring oiling system works. We've seen how a force feed lubrication system is put together in each of the components that goes into it. And then we talked about two types of shaft seals that are in common use. Take some time now to read through the section of your text on this subject and clear up any questions you might have. There are mechanics who can walk past a piece of equipment and tell you just from the way it sounds whether it's working right or not. Over the years, they've developed an instinct for what's happening. It comes from working with the machinery and observing what happens when it's in operation. Obviously, if you work at developing this kind of knowledge, you'll be able to sense a problem almost before it starts and go about fixing it. It's worth the effort because it means you'll always be ahead of the game. So after you've learned everything the text has to say about bearings and everything we've covered here, continue the learning process on your own in the plant. Don't just rely on your memory. Try to get a sense of how things sound and smell and feel. Then you'll develop diagnostic skills that'll give you the edge you need to be a first-rate mechanic. There are three major indications of how a bearing's doing. Temperature, vibration, and noise. These can tell you that it's okay or that something's wrong before you take it apart. But you can't use the indicators to tell you what's wrong unless you know what to expect under normal circumstances. Let's start with some basic facts. For example, do you know why any bearing's hotter when it's operating than when it's not? That's it. Friction causes the heat. After you start up a piece of equipment, its bearings warm up until they reach their normal operating temperature. It'll stay constant after that if everything's okay. Now, normal operating temperature for most bearings is around 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees centigrade. If the temperature of a bearing starts to increase suddenly, you might have a problem on your hands. The temperature of a bearing could go up for a number of reasons. For example, uh, a change in operating conditions. If the speed of a pump were increased to make the pump move more water, the pump bearing temperature might go up slightly. But if it's a sudden increase that can't be explained, then it's likely that the bearing has failed. Now, how are you going to know if it's running hot? First, you have to know what normal is. Most of the time, experience tells you what normal is. In other words, touching it tells you whether or not it's running hot. This might be the crudest method, but it's also the one used most often. There are a couple of other ways to check the temperature of a bearing that are more exact. 
One is to use a contact pyrometer. The other is a device called a thermocouple. A contact pyrometer looks like this. It's an instrument that measures the temperature of a bearing's housing. You just press it against the housing like this and read the temperature on the dial. Even though the temperature of the housing is not exactly the same as the temperature of the bearing, it's related to it. It'll give you a point of reference. A change in the temperature of the bearing housing indicates a possible problem with the bearing. A thermocouple is a more exact measurement device because it measures the temperature of the bearing itself. It's actually embedded in the bearing material to monitor its temperature. For example, these thermocouples are embedded in a turbine. You won't find a thermocouple on every bearing because installing them is difficult and expensive. Ordinarily, they're used on bearings whose operation is particularly critical. Measurements from the thermocouple are normally read out somewhere other than at the equipment. For example, it might read out on a recorder like the one you see here. Vibration is another indicator of how a bearing's operating. You can feel vibration. Sometimes you walk by a machine and be able to feel vibration through the floor or hear it humming. You can reach out and feel vibration, but it's much more difficult to detect changes in vibration than it is to detect an increase in temperature. There are instruments to measure vibration. Some models are portable, others are permanently installed. These instruments have a probe that measures the frequency and intensity of the vibration of whatever object the probe is placed against. The probe takes this information and converts it electronically into a meter reading. Like pyrometers, the portable models usually have a dial that indicates this measurement. Permanent models are usually read out on a recorder or meter at a control center elsewhere in the plant. You might also want to take the time to check these permanently installed monitors. They're very effective maintenance tools if they're used properly. They provide a record of how a bearing has operated over a period of time that you can use in addition to the maintenance records. Noise is a third indicator of a bearing's condition. After a while, you'll become accustomed to normal noise levels in various areas of the plant. Then you'll be able to detect changes in the noise a bearing makes when something goes wrong. There are no instruments involved. It just happens. Experienced mechanics get so they can detect very subtle changes in bearing noise. To sum up, there are three main indicators of a bearing's condition that you should become familiar with. Temperature, vibration, and noise. Apart from these three main indicators, another thing you might check out is an oil flow site. An oil flow site is a visual indication of oil flow. Its first purpose is to alert you if the oil flow stops but you can also pick up on other conditions that exist by examining the oil after it leaves the bearing. For example, a change in the color of the oil or evidence of particles of babbit or grit would alert you to the possibility of critical bearing problems. The best policy is use every bit of information available to find out about a bearing or any piece of equipment you're working on. Learn how to diagnose a situation. Figure out as much as you can about a problem before you start to take the equipment apart. And finally, find out what it's like when it's working right, so you'll know when something's wrong. Take some time now to review the information on diagnosing the operation of a bearing, starting with the three major indicators of bearing operation, temperature, vibration, and noise. If you have any questions about these signs or the instruments used to detect them, be sure to bring them up with your instructor while they're still fresh in your mind. We've talked about how to detect problems in a bearing. Now let's talk about the problems themselves. It's important to know what causes abnormal temperatures, noise, and vibration, because they can lead to bearing failure. So we'll cover several of the causes and tell you why they happen. The first cause is metal fatigue. It happens because the bearing metal is weakened by the flexing and bending that occurs during operation. Now all sliding surface bearings are subject to load and vibration. This is what produces the flexing and bending. It's only a small amount, but it gradually weakens the bearing over a long period of time. Eventually, the bearing surface becomes so weak it can't support the load. So the surface breaks up and becomes rough. This increases temperature and vibration and causes even more damage to the bearing. This process continues until the bearing fails.
Fatigue failure is something that will eventually happen to any metal bearing. It can't be prevented forever, but the bearing will last longer if it's properly installed. Installation is a complex process, and now's not the time to get into it. It'll be covered in another program. Another common cause of bearing problems is misalignment. A bearing's misaligned when its shaft doesn't pass through it squarely. Instead, the shaft rubs against one side of the bearing at one end and against the opposite side at the other. This wears away the film of lubricant between the shaft and the bearing. Continued rubbing causes two things to happen. The temperature of the bearing goes up because of the increased friction, and it wears out rapidly where the shaft touches it. The high temperature also causes further problems. It can cause the lubricant in the bearing to break down. This will cause the bearing to fail. It can also melt the metal in the bearing. If a bearing's made of Babbitt, for example, it'll begin to melt at approximately 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 260 degrees centigrade. It's not uncommon for a bearing to get this hot if it's misaligned. If the bearing material melts, the bearing will fail. That's what happened to the one you see here. It got so hot that it melted and began to run out of its housing. Wear due to misalignment also leaves characteristic marks on the bearing. The bearing gets worn where it's in contact with the shaft. In the drawing we looked at a minute ago, the wear marks would be here and here. If you notice wear marks at the ends of a bearing, there's a strong possibility that the bearing and its shaft aren't properly aligned. Sliding surface bearings can also have problems because of improper lubrication. Improper lubrication can mean too little lubricant, the wrong kind of lubricant, or contaminated lubricant. As we've already said, it's also a problem if the bearing gets so hot that the lubricant breaks down from high temperature. It's easy to understand why too little lubricant causes sliding surface bearing problems. If there isn't enough lubricant in a bearing to form a film between the rotating shaft and the bearing, the shaft will wear it out and cause it to fail. Sometimes small portions of the bearing will stick to the shaft. In other words, they'll be pulled out of the bearing surface. This is called wiping because the shaft wipes away the pieces. Wiping produces grooves in the bearing surface, like the ones you see here. It's a fairly common type of sliding surface bearing failure, and you probably come across it a lot in the plant. Why the wrong kind of lubricant is a problem isn't quite so obvious. The lubricant in a sliding surface bearing must have the right properties for that particular bearing. Its thickness or viscosity is the most important of these properties, but it's not the only one. If a lubricant is used that has the wrong properties, film lubrication between the shaft and the bearing is affected. For example, if the lubricant's too thin, the film won't form properly. Another problem occurs if the lubricant can't tolerate the temperature that the bearing normally operates at. Either of these conditions would interfere with film lubrication and lead to failure. Contaminants in lubricant also interfere with film lubrication. Contaminants can be either liquids or solids. Liquid contaminants, like water, for example, change a lubricant's properties so it can't operate as it should. Solid contaminants, like dirt, get squeezed between the bearing and the shaft, and the bearing wears out more rapidly than it should. Well, we've covered three problems that can produce bearing failure. Metal fatigue, misalignment, and improper lubrication. You should understand why each of these is a problem and how it happens. Let's take a few minutes now to review the material we've covered in this program. First, we discussed how a sliding surface bearing works and some of the materials that are used to make this type of bearing. Remember that Babbitt is the material that's most often used. Then we looked at three kinds of journal bearings and three kinds of thrust bearings. We examined the features of each one and explained what they were for. Finally, we talked about how sliding surface bearings are lubricated the three major indications of bearing performance, and the importance of developing the skills you need to diagnose what's happening with a bearing. Take a few minutes now to read through the last section of your text and answer the questions you'll find there.